Shalom. This week we are reading Parshat Ve'et Hanan. The Torah portion begins with a prayer. The word Ve'et Hanan, the root of this word is Hanun, which denotes a type of undeserved mercy. Indeed, commenting on this word, the great Rashi explains that this word always refers to a gift outright, a gift undeserved. And the idea is that even though the truly righteous could expect results when they pray, that is, they could anticipate a positive answer to their prayers based on their own merits, based on their own good deeds. Look, God, I, look what I've accomplished in this world, look what I've done for you, but no, that's not how they do it. Va'et Hanan, the idea is that Moshe is explaining when he prayed, the great tzaddikim, the righteous people, they never approach God on that level but they only ask for God's mercy as an undeserved gift. And what does it mean, I beseeched God at that time? What is that, that time that Moses is referring to? He's recalling to Israel that after, he says, after I conquered the lands of Sichon and Og in accordance with God's instructions, I thought that maybe the Almighty would rescind his decree, might be prepared to allow me to come into the land of Israel after all, but that wasn't the case. So as our portion opens, Moshe is recounting how he implored, begged, besought God to rescind his decree against him and allow him to enter into the land of Israel after all. And speaking of his own prayers that he offered at that time, Moses here states, I implored Hashem at that time saying, my Lord Hashem Elohim, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. For what power is there in the heaven or on the earth that can perform according to your deeds and according to your mighty acts? Let me now cross and see the good land that is on the other side of the Jordan, this good mountain and the Lebanon. He doesn't seem to be asking, at least in the simple words, he doesn't seem to be asking to live a long time there. He didn't even ask to stay. As the sages state, did Moses have a desire to eat the fruit of the land of Israel, to be satiated from its goodness? No, he wanted an opportunity to fulfill the special mitzvot, the special commandments of the land of Israel that can only be performed in the land of Israel. And here, according to the simple meaning of the words, he just wanted to see. And to see what? He says, this good mountain and the Lebanon the Lebanon. And the words, this good mountain, actually allude to Jerusalem and the concept of the Lebanon, an allusion to the Holy Temple made from the cedars of Lebanon, which brings about the whitening, as it were, the lightening of sin. The root of the word Lebanon, Lebanon being Lavan, which means white. So here, once again, there is no coincidence Parashat Ve'et Hanan falls out this week, which began with the fast of Tisha B'Av, the fast of the ninth day of the month of Av, commemorating the destruction of the holy temples. And this Shabbat is known as the Sabbath of Comfort, Shabbat Nachamu, based on the first words of the Haftarah, the prophetic reading of this Sabbath beginning in Isaiah chapter 40, Comfort, Comfort my people. And this week also includes a festival, at least a festival in the time of the Holy Temple, known as Tuba Av, the 15th day of the month of Av, which is a time of great rejoicing in the time of the Holy Temple. And we see that the parasha, Parashat Ve'et Hanan, begins with a strong connection to the Holy Temple, Moshe's desire to see it. Essentially, this parsha's theme is Moshe once again preparing his people for beginning their new life in the land of Israel. The entire Torah portion is replete, simply overflowing with Moshe's love for God, his love for his people, and his love for the land of Israel, which he was not going to be entering into and the integral, irrevocable connection between the performance of God's commandments and the land, 
And thus we read in chapter 4, for example, And now, O Israel, hearken to the statutes, to the judgments, which I teach you to do, in order that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your forefathers is giving you. Do not add to the word which I command you, nor diminish from it, to observe the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Behold, I have taught you statutes and ordinances, as the Lord my God commanded me, to do so in the midst of the land to which you are coming to possess. And we read, And you shall keep them and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the eyes of the peoples, who will hear all these statutes and say, Only this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is at all times that we call upon Him? And which great nation is it that has just statutes and ordinances as this entire Torah which I set before you this day? And in chapter 5, as Moshe introduces the second version of the Ten Commandments, the version here in the book of Deuteronomy, we read, And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances which I speak in your ears this day, and learn them, and observe them to do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Chorev. Not with our forefathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us, we, all of whom are here alive today. Face to face, the Lord spoke with you at the mountain out of the midst of the fire. And in chapter 6 we read, This is the commandment, the statutes, and the ordinances that the Lord your God commanded to teach you, to perform in the land which you are about to pass to possess it in order that you fear the Lord your God to keep all His statutes and His commandments that I command you, your son and your son's son, all the days of your life, and in order that your days may be lengthened. And you shall therefore hearken, O Israel, to be sure to perform, so that it will be good for you, and so that you may increase exceedingly, just as the Lord your God, the God of your fathers, spoke to you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Actually, we see that there are two themes working in this parsha, in this Torah portion, together. Two sides of one coin are actually one solid unit, two-pronged. The performance of God's commandments in His land and the concept of prayer. The parsha opens with Moshe's prayer, or rather, prayers, because a unique tradition teaches us that Moshe actually composed 515 prayers, which is based in part on the numerical value of the word ve'etchanan. It's something that the sages deduce. And in these 515 original prayers, Moses beseeched God to allow him to enter into the land of Israel. However, God's plans, both for the good of Moshe and the good of all of Israel, were set, and His decision were, was final, sort of, because you know that no prayer goes unanswered. Every prayer makes its impression and affects the universe, whether we see the results that we wanted or not. And ultimately, our sages emphasize, Moshe will in enter into the land at a later date. And amazingly, we are taught that God was, no, be careful here, God was, as it were, reaching a breaking point, if such a thing could be said, and He was committed to not changing His mind, and so, as it's written in verse 26, it's too much for you. Do not continue to speak to me further about this matter, because we are so taught that if Moshe would have uttered one more prayer, as it were the 516th prayer, he would have tipped the scale and the decree would have been rescinded, which for cosmic reasons God had decided could not happen. So God basically said, let me not hear that one more prayer. I will not hear that prayer, that one other prayer. So then, what we are actually being told is that one more prayer would have done it? This is a very enigmatic idea. 
And is it not amazing in this Torah portion of the unity, the bond between the land and the commandments and prayer, is it not amazing that in this Torah portion that falls out in the week that began with the destruction of the Holy Temple, the ninth of Av, the very same week that includes the joyous day of Tuba Av, the 15th of Av, a harbinger of the rebuilding of the Temple, which fell out on Friday this week. Is it not instructive to us that this very Torah portion, which emphasizes the twin aspects of Torah, commandments, and prayer, features the Shema, the paragon, archetype, the quintessential hallmark of prayer is Shema Yisrael, which we find here in chapter 6, Parashat Vatchanan. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And continue with that paragraph, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your means. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your hearts. You shall teach them to your sons and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the way, and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be for ornaments between your eyes, and you shall inscribe them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. And by the way, there is a history here, because Moshe records these words here, but they are not his. The words of Shema Yisrael originally were uttered by the twelve sons of Yaakov, Jacob, back in Genesis as they stood around his deathbed and declared to him that they would carry on his spiritual legacy, his spiritual work in this world. It's a challenge just to try and describe how important these words are. This declaration of Shema Yisrael, Hear, O Israel, Hashem is our God, Hashem, the name, is one, is so all-inclusive and so powerful a statement that it can easily be described as the sum total of the Jewish experience, of the meaning of Jewish people. It's recited by every Jew every day, at least twice. It is the declaration of faith that accompanies every major moment of Jewish existence. It is the reason for our existence, actually. You've heard of the great the French philosopher and mathematician René Descartes, who said, of course, uh, also known as the father of modern philosophy, he said, I think, therefore I am. Well, this is like, there is only one God, therefore we exist. And we are commanded to love God. But how does that work? How does the Torah demand from us an emotion? Either you love someone or you don't, no? How does the Torah command us to and hold us responsible for an emotion? Is that what love is? Is it, is it an emotion? If we define it, here's what we'll find, a noun, love. An intense feeling of deep affection. Uh, a person or thing that one loves. Uh, a deep romantic or sexual attachment to someone. That has nothing to do with this, none of that. First of all, before we talk about what it means to love God, what does it mean that God is really one? Just as His being one doesn't mean simply that, oh, there aren't three or 56, because that's obvious, that there is only one. But the nature of that oneness is the issue. It's that, and this is the secret of Shema, there is nothing else really in this world. And everything, all of existence, all of life is a part of that oneness. So we are taught, what does it mean to love God with all your heart? It means that we are completely focused on God as being our life with every aspect of our personality, whether positive traits or negative with our whole person. What does it mean with all our soul? With the understanding that our soul isn't even ours, it's on deposit, it's His, and were He to take it from us for the fact that He is one and we have to declare that, 
If that's the price, then that's the price. And what does it mean with all our means? It means obeying Him is the most precious com commodity, no matter what it costs. This is so comprehensive that it's actually like Moshe's 516th prayer. And we say it every day. We declare to the whole world that there's no one else we love. There's nothing else to live for, and indeed nothing else at all really in this world other than God. That oneness is so comprehensive and so all-encompassing that that's the subject of our love, meaning that is the subject of our totality, of our being, of who we are, of why we exist. And this understanding and declaration of this oneness as the object of our love is that which Moshe here bequeaths to the people of Israel, and it's the totality of our being that it expresses. This very week, when we're so focused on our holy temple, this week, which began with Tisha B'Av, the day of mourning for the holy temple, and concludes with the 15th of Av, a joyous day in temple times, and Shabbat Nachamu, the Sabbath of consolation, all these dates that are totally focused on the holy temple, this week, in which Parashat Ve'etchanan begins with Moshe's fondest prayer to enter into the land and behold the Holy Temple, this week has it all. The devotion of Moshe to his God, his land, and his people, and the people of Israel's devotion to their God as expressed in this ultimate declaration of his unity. And what better place to declare it, to declare that unity, than the site of the Holy Temple? This week we witnessed a Jewish man declaring God's oneness at the holiest site on earth, the Temple Mount, location of the Holy Temple. According to the Torah's prescription, he recited Shema Yisrael, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And for uttering with perfect faith this timeless statement of God's unity and our love for him, he was summarily removed from the Temple Mount and arrested. And you can see it here at the end of this clip. Did Moshe see that coming? When he begged God to be able to see that good mountain and the Lebanon, he wanted to experience the Holy Temple and God denied his request. Perhaps it was this very scene of pain, pathos, injustice, and desecration that God wanted to prevent his beloved and trusted servant from seeing. But we, who have come into the land, who have been given the legacy of Moshe. We who have come into the land, let us keep declaring God to be one and His name one at the site of the Holy Temple and everywhere until the whole world knows that there is only one God in the heavens above and on the earth below whose name is one, for this is the divinely mandated task of the people of Israel and their land, keeping the commandments of God. <laughs> Ooh.